grace and peace to you. Thank you, as I said to Chris, the perfect day to sleep in. So thank you for coming. I wanted to um, draw your attention first thing to the photograph that's on the front of your bulletin. It's Trinity Sunday. It's the one Sunday in the church year where we focus our scripture and our sermon on the fact that the God we claim is three in one, one in three. It's Trinity Sunday. So I selected this picture. Um, I was once um, vacationing in Phoenix and wandered into a small city park that was a sculpture garden. and was just moving from sculpture to sculpture. And then I saw this sculpture that was near the back of the garden. And it's the children are life-size, life-size bronze children that are arms outstretched and they're beautiful, they're in motion. They're the skirt and the pigtails are flying. And I thought, oh, look at that. And I walked closer to the statue to see, you can see if you look carefully at the picture, there was an opening in the circle. You see how the children, are, are, their arms are outstretched. And there's that area where the grass is worn down. Because when you come upon the statue, it's invitational. You immediately stand there, and you reach to your right and your left, and you, you hold hands with the children in the circle. That statue needs you. So what does a circular dance, and what does an opening in the circle, and what does a person coming along and completing the circle have to do with Trinity Sunday? Well, let us discover that together. Let us worship God. Friends, let us pray together using the prayer that is printed in your bulletin. O oh, blessed Trinity, in whom we know the maker of all things seen and unseen, the savior of all both near and far, by your spirit enable so to worship your divine majesty that with all the company of heaven we may magnify your glorious name saying, holy, 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 glory to you, O Lord most high, amen.
let us confess our sins before God and one another. Triune God, we praise you as a God of love and life. Though Jesus prayed that we would be one, we confess that we fail to live in unity with each other and with you. We break our communion through hostile words and unkind actions. We long for your spirit to heal us and to correct us. We long for you to help us experience communion with you and with each other as we gather around your word. Even now, dependent on your grace, we commit ourselves to the more fully in the unity you desire through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In Christ, by the power of the Spirit, we are forgiven. Thanks be to the triune God.
Jack and Jace, I know that you're in youth group, but would you be willing to come up? I need, um, we're going to act something out. I need more people this morning. I'm grateful. Thank you. Good morning. If Jack and Jace and Cooper and Jonathan and Matthew and Hannah and Mackenzie and Madison, good morning. You look so comfortable on the steps, but this morning I'm going to ask you to do some moving around. Mm -hmm. We're going to, um, this is Trinity Sunday, and this is a day in the life of the church once a year where we lift up that our God is triune. That means that our God is three persons, one God. One God, three persons. And it's a complicated idea. So we're going to act it out. Um, Jack, would you be willing to come over here? And it'll do Jack, and how about Matthew and Cooper? Come on over here. And you three are going to be the three persons, one God. And how you're three persons, one God, is you're going to make a little circle by holding hands. Okay. And in the Bible, it tells us. All right, ready? You're going to, now you're going to move around in a circle. Not so much you get dizzy, because God is reasonable. There's our God. Three persons, one God, ever moving, moved over the face of the waters. We hear about it in the book of Genesis at the very beginning. Now, all of us on the steps, come on over here, stand up. We're the people. We are the people. And God keeps doing God-like things. Keep moving. Never stop moving. God never stops moving. We are the people, and we're living our lives, and every now and then we have this sense of what God is doing in the world, and the Bible is filled with stories about what that God is doing. And we're going to, God never trips over wires, so we're going to move that. Then, you know what happened? God has all sorts of, God loves us, wants the best for us, but you know what all of us do? Kind of naughty things. We like our ideas better than that God's idea. So things don't go so well for us, humans, here. And God keeps noticing. And we're not going to be silly. God notices what these humans are doing and tries and says, hold on, hold on, this isn't working. So God sends part of God's self to come be with a human. What? Yes! That's Christmas. That's what we celebrate. That. God sends God's self to the people. And Jesus performs miracles and teaches. I think God's still kind of active. I don't, God, it's like it's still going on while Jesus is there. Yeah. Keep moving. Not crazy fast, right? Because God is reasonable. OK, so Jesus comes to the people. And what do we think of Jesus coming to the people? Are we happy that Jesus is with us now on earth? And Jesus does miracles and teaches and says things that don't always make sense, and it's a lot to think about. And do we, all the people, do we love Jesus and accept what Jesus does for us? Yes? Yeah, some of the time. But then eventually it doesn't go so well for Jesus, right? Were you here at Easter? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Remember what happened to Jesus? Yes, Hannah, what do you remember? He got killed. So enough of this. They decided to kill Jesus. That didn't go so well. So then if the story stopped there, that's a pretty sad story. But that's not the end of the story. Because girls, do you remember on Easter? Did you dress up and come to church on Easter? It's a celebration. Why did we celebrate on Easter? Because Jesus was alive. Jesus rose from the dead. Now what that has to do, because Jesus came, and rose from the dead. Jesus comes back and joins back with God, slowly. 
But because Jesus came, that enabled all of us to join in, hold hands, now we're all in the circle. Madison and Mackenzie, come join the circle. Jesus made a place for us in the circle. You have to fix your shoe before you come in. When Jesus came to be with us and went back to be with God, now all of us are able to be in the circle with God. That's what Jesus did. Thank you. You are all magnificent. Thank you for coming up on Trinity Sunday. Peace be with you. You can go back to your parents or Discovery to Mrs. Willerman is here for Discovery time. Okay. Announcements. Um, friends, you probably already know this. There is a brief congregational meeting immediately following the service. So we'll have the concluding music, and then we'll move right into our congregational meeting. Um, following that, we have the picnic in Fellowship Hall, in sunny Fellowship Hall, because it's not sunny outside. And should they move from this meeting directly to Fellowship Hall? Is that the plan? All right. Um, in, and in your bulletin, if you're curious about the congregational meeting, we're electing a new slate of elders and deacons and the new nominating committee that will serve um, moving forward beginning in September. I also want to share with you next Sunday is a both unusual and important Sunday in the life of this church. And that is because um, we are in the process of a mission study. I spoke about it one Sunday. This mission study is typically what congregations do during the time of pastoral transition. And so you don't do it very often, and you don't do it for every pastoral transition. You, you just do it when it hasn't been done for a while. The goal of a mission study is to clarify the identity, the current identity of the congregation, and also to clarify the mission of this church as it looks toward the future that God has prepared for us. As part of that mission study, one aspect of it is a survey. And the survey will be administered during worship next week. It will be administered during worship. It takes it, um, approximately 20, it could take as long as 30 minutes. So the fact that it's taking place during worship is unusual, which we don't take lightly, but it underscores the importance that we have as many people as possible complete the survey. And um, we need to get about 100 people to take the survey for, it, for the results to be valid. And so if we just put it on our website and sent you letters and said, take it, we might be you know, tapping people on the shoulder for quite a while to get to 100, which is why we're doing it during worship, because we want a good chunk um, to take it then. What if you're not in worship next Sunday? No problem. You can take it at a different time. It's OK. Um, you can take it online. So we're going to ask that it's an electronic survey. If you bring your iPhone, Android, a tablet, a laptop, you can get on the Wi-Fi here, and you can take it. If, you're, if you don't want to do that, or you don't have the devices to do that, paper copies will be, will be given out next Sunday in the sanctuary. Again, next Sunday is not the only time, but we're hoping to get a lot of people. And then we can follow up, all of us reaching out to others so that we get the most people possible, which ensures the most valid um, information, that it's truly a representation of everybody's thoughts and opinions and preferences and ideas about this congregation. I want to say um, we are working with Holy Cow Consultants. Isn't that cute? Holy Cow Consultants. 
That was their rec that's the people that were purchasing the uh, survey from, and that was their recommendation, that it be administered during worship. And just so you know, so you have more information, the results of the survey will be tabulated by Holy Cow consultants. Um, for people um, also know this, that participating in the survey is one opportunity for you to uh, share and respond to your ideas and your thoughts. It is not the only thing. It's not just the survey and that's it. Um, it'll be starting approximately in August. We want to get the results back from the survey. There will be times of invitation where anyone who's interested can come and come to a listening circle and can talk more freely at that time. So if there's something that you really, really want to say and the survey doesn't scratch that itch for you, it's not the only opportunity. Um, just so you know, um, children 14 and up People 14 and up can take the survey. So we want to hear from a range. Oh, and then uh, my husband made the point this morning. He said, you know, often like we get one of these surveys at our house and we look at each other and whoever gets the short straw has to do it, you know, like your car dealership uh, survey. In this situation, we want everybody in your family to take one, right? So as you come as a couple or a threesome or foursome, everybody take the survey. Evan, my partner in crime, did I get the big ones? Does anyone have any questions about next week? We thought about not telling you and just surprise you because you kind of go, well, I don't know. Who wants? I don't know if I want to go to church. But, but no, we're telling you because it is really important. Um, there will be worshipful elements in the rest of the hour. It's not going to be you come and take the survey and leave. Um, but it's very important, and so we're... We're excited about this next step in this mission study. Any questions? We would. We would prefer if you do it online, but we don't. But if that would prevent you from doing it at all, then no. Um, we have to pay more if their hand, if you do it, if you do it on paper. And to avoid paying more, the staff and I, we've already been in conversation. We will just simply input the answers so that it can, and it also slows down the return on how quickly we get the results. But, but if, uh, if paper is the only way you'll do it, we'll take that too. Yes. I believe Chuck, Russ, Evan, the mission study team, anyone? Anyone? And staff will take it as well. They, they, they ask that staff take it. Anything else? Wonderful. Let us continue in worship. For you to join us in two different sections, and the words will be up on the screen.
Let us pray. Lord of heaven and earth, pour out on us the abundant gifts of your Holy Spirit. May the work begun by the Spirit on the day of Pentecost continue in us as we hear your word and do your will. Amen. Today's scripture reading is Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Our second reading is taken from the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, spilling over into the 16th chapter. Listen for the Spirit to move through these words. When the Advocate comes, whom I, Jesus, will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said these things to you to keep you from stumbling. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, an hour is coming when those who kill you will think that by doing so, they are offering worship to God. And they will do this because they have not known the Father or me. But I have said these things to you so that when their hour comes, you, re you may remember that I told you about them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said, that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. 
The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So explaining the Trinity, it's hard to do. Um, part of the ordination process, one of the final stages of the ordination process, is the candidate for ordination has a statement of faith and goes on the floor of Presbytery, about 200 people, reads the statement of faith, and then there's microphones open to questions, any questions at all, about your statement of faith or something you omitted. And I, I can't speak for everyone who's ever gone through it, but thinking that somebody might stand up at the microphone and ask me to explain the Trinity was something that kept me up late at night. Because the more you get specific, it's easy to get tied up in words. God is difficult to explain. The Trinity, three persons united in perfect relationship, they are distinct but yet indivisible. They're in equal relationship, right? Not one is higher than the other. There is no hierarchy within the Trinity. They um, are in willing obedience. Each surrenders to the other two. Now it's hard to put those all together. So a Greek word helps, I think, understand a little more how this three-in-one God, one God in three persons, makes sense. And in some ways, I could preview this entire sermon that if you listen to the children's sermon, you don't really have to listen now. <laughs> um, perichoresis is the Greek word, perichoresis. So peri means around, as in the word perimeter. And choresis means, it's the Greek word meaning to dance. It's where you get the word choreographer, a choreography. It's the art, is the study of dance. So the Greek word perichoresis makes sense that there is movement, there's dancing around. The triune God is in continual dance. So characteristics of three persons in a dance, continuous movement, and the dance is one of perfect submission. Not one of the three is the leader of the dance. They're all equal participants. Which leads me pretty quickly to the next question. Why does this matter? So what that our God is triune? What difference does it make to anybody who's attending worship? So that's when, um, as I'm thinking about this, on vacation in Phoenix, I saw that sculpture of the photograph on the front of your building, of, of your bulletin. And I, as I said, I walked toward the sculpture, and you don't even, you don't even, you don't even know you want to. It's so invitational. As soon as you get there, you bend and you take out, you, you, you touch hands with those children who were waiting for you to arrive. I was surprised to discover this silent invitation. I was delighted to participate by holding hands. They had been outstretched waiting for me to arrive. And I was moved to notice as I'm holding the hands of the bronze children and I completed the circle, I looked down and there was a small plaque on the ground and the statue is titled, Peace. The peace was not complete until I arrived and participated. Pretty clever sculptor, don't you think? The sculptor made room in that statue for another. The one who could come along and join hands and complete the encircling movement. You see, a couple millennia ago, that's what God noticed, an incomplete circle. It was difficult for humans to dance with God. The Israelites were having a hard time ordering their lives in the movements of God's design. 
and being together in ways that honored their creator and loved their neighbor. And our three in one God, God in three, hatched a plan to address this situation once and for all. God sent one person of God's self to us in human form, right? The, the beginning of the Gospel of John, the word took on flesh and dwelled among us. And Emmanuel means God with us. God in the flesh to talk to us, to walk with us, to teach and heal and perform miracles. God got our attention and many people believed. And this plan, this plan of God, well, it began to crumble. The followers of Jesus saw the hope for their Messiah dashed. As Jesus was unfairly condemned and sentenced to death, Jesus was killed, but death did not hold him. His words again, hear these words again from the Gospel of John. This is Jesus talking to the disciples about his leaving. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. What looked like the end of the story when Jesus was hanging on the cross on Easter, it was really the beginning of a new story. The, world, the word made flesh taught us, modeled a way of loving our neighbors, perfected our imperfections, taught us to pray. It became human and became the one, the only one able to complete the circle. Jesus Christ is Lord of the dance. Jesus stepped into the circle of human life, held hands with us, joined in with us, experienced blue skies, pouring rain like this morning, ate lavish dinners and simple meals, conversed with lowly prostitutes and powerful kings, knew the joy of friendships and the pain of suffering. Jesus came among us, friends, to teach us and to show us how to dance. God created us to live and move and have our being in ways that mimic the great dance of the triune God. No hierarchy, distinct, but united, submissive posture to one another. We yield to one another. However, it is difficult and complicated to dance with other people. We step on toes. We want to lead the dance. We have other things that attract our attention more than dancing. We don't want to hold hands in the circle with somebody we don't like, or we might even hate them. What do we do when we're not willing to hold hands with our neighbor? Or we don't like the dance that everybody else is dancing. Very often, we resist joining the dance. And every time we resist the dance, God among us, or exclude someone else from dancing, or spend more energy arguing about the dance, we make it not very appealing to people who don't even know much about dancing at all. All the ways we mess up the dance, we are interfering with God's intentions for us and for the world. That being said, the dance of our three-in-one God will never be perfected. But our attempts to mimic God's movements is our mission. So once upon a time, I was a point in my seminary education and um, awaiting my first call, and so I decided to go visiting as many churches as I could. 
If I was really lucky, I could hit some churches have an 8 a.m. service and then the 10 or the 11. In a few afternoon, I could sometimes hit three in a day. It was a time of great exploration and you just kind of see, witness what other churches do. And so one Sunday morning, I made my way. I heard of this little Presbyterian church. It's down in the Italian market neighborhood of uh, South Philly. And um, there were about 40 people in worship, 30 to 40, I think was pretty typical. And during worship, it was during the pastoral prayer, the pastor came down from the pulpit and stood on the floor and invited the congregation to open, he opened up the floor to share, people to share joys and concerns. And several people in the pews raised their hands one by one and the pastor called, pastor called them by name, which told me as the visitor, he knew them, they were regulars. And there were concerns, there were chronic illness, there were family tensions, there were birthday joys. And then the pastor um, pointed to a man who was seated at the back of the sanctuary. And the pastor asked the man's name, again telling me that, that person was not known in that worship community. The visitor gave his name and in halting speech, standing up where he was, he began, I need you, I don't pray. I don't know who to pray to or even how to pray. My family needs prayer. We have suffered a terrible tragedy. My elderly aunt was burned to death two days ago in her row home in South Philadelphia. My family, my family, we are sad and confused. Will you pray for us? Pray what you want, but pray, please. I don't know what else to do. His prayer request was voiced, it was received, and the worship service went on. During the singing of the final hymn, my mind was racing and reeling to make sense of what I, what all of us, had just heard. Now later I learned a bit more about this man. No one knew his name, but a couple of women recognized his face because he was one of the weekly regulars that came to the food cupboard that operated out of the basement of this church. He knew this church to be a place that gave away food to the hungry. Now, unlike this worldly economy that you go to the grocery store, you put it on the conveyor belt and they add it up and you pay what you owe, or you go to a restaurant and you eat and at some point, the wait staff slides a bill onto the table and that's what you pay. This man experienced a very different way of getting food for his family. It was simply given. It was given weekly with a smile and a glad heart. This man in seeking food entered the place where folks moved in odd yet welcoming ways. Who gives away food? So it makes sense that when he and his family were reeling with grief and needed something that they couldn't really name, this stranger came to that church. Those people who were crazy enough to give away free food, maybe those church folks knew something. Or maybe someone who his family needed. 
Perhaps their act of praying could slow this spin of dizzying, grief-filled emotions. Not at all sure why those people do what they do, but it was worth asking for help to transform grief into something bearable. So while singing the final hymn, as I said, my thoughts were rehearsing what I wanted to immediately turn around and go say to that stranger in the back pew. I wanted to offer my condolences and let him know that I would continue to pray for him and thank him for entrusting his need to us. And when I turned around to speak, he was gone. He had silently slipped out the back door during the final hymn. Looking back on that morning, I experienced this stranger's prayer request as a moment of revelation, a bright white light of love revealed in the back pew. He was the seeker right? He was seeking us, the one searching for a place, a people who gathered in circles to worship by the one who moves powerfully in ways that are not log logical, but they're graceful and true. Yet, yet his presence in worship that morning left me wondering. Could that have been the Lord of the dance himself? You see, Revelation often makes sense in retrospect, looking back on it than it does in the moment. How like the Spirit to reveal God's self in a place where the hungry are given food. The living Christ there among us that morning asking us to be his prayer. The stranger came to us, was sent to us, begging for help to transform his grief. And in the asking, I believe we met the Lord of the dance gathering us in, sweeping us up, and moving among us, and in the dance that he leads, we are transformed more and more into his likeness. Sisters and brothers in Christ, the three persons of the Trinity who are joined in dance-like movement opened their circle to include all of us, took on flesh and lived among us to teach us and to be with us, and we are invited to follow those dance steps. We are invited to dance our way toward new life, led by the Lord of the dance, who is here with us. In the name of the Creator, the Sustainer, and the Redeemer, amen.
You may be seated. Let us enter into this time of sustained prayer. Triune God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we adore you for your threeness and oneness, a holy mystery. We are in awe of that same unfathomable mystery reflected in the creation around us, the complexity of an atom, the birth of a child. Your ways are higher than our ways, your thoughts greater than our thoughts. So although we acknowledge that we do not always understand your ways, we continue to offer you our prayers for creation and its care, that we may persevere toward environmental justice. For the nations of the world, especially the places where hunger, war, and poverty are daily realities. For our nation and its leaders, may your wisdom guide their governing. For this community of Maple Glen, may it be a place of neighborly kindness, forgiveness, and generosity. And for this local church, Supli, in its ministry during this time of transition, Support us in our efforts to clarify your vision for us, that we may be the church that serves your need and pursues your good works. Gracious God, hear our gratitude for the countless ways you bring healing and restore strength. We pray for persons we know who are bearing burdens or illness, we pray for Kit Reed, who is now in hospice care. We pray for Jane, recovering from knee surgery. We pray for those undergoing treatment for disease, for those enduring pain, for those who are distraught and depressed. We pray this day for Judy, Nick, Bob, Carl, Evelyn, Colt, Bob, Carol, Gail, and Joey. We pray also for those, Lord, that are not on this list, and we know it's more. And so we pray also for those we hold in our hearts that we do not name aloud. We pray all this to you in the name of the triune God, three in one, from eternity to eternity. Thank you for hearing us as we continue this prayer, now praying together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to thank you for listening to and accepting our messages about stewardship through the year. Thank you for keeping up with your pledges despite difficult times. Thank you for your gifts of time, talents, and treasures. And thank you for your tithes and offerings. We are grateful for your support and very much appreciate your generosity. <laughs>
Father, thank you that all things were created through you and for you. You are before all things, and in you all things exist. The Bible says that we should bring our tithes and offerings into your storehouse, and that you will respond by opening the windows of heaven and sending down blessing upon blessing. Accept the gifts we place before you now. May the peace of God reign in our lives, the love of God surround us, the Spirit of God empower us, and the joy of our God uphold us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. And those that must leave now, then go in peace to love and serve the Lord, knowing that the triune God travels with you. And for the rest of us that are staying for the congregational meeting, please be seated. Get rid of that. 